sports medicine physician, and today I'm gonna react to funniest medical memes. Oh, I saw this video the other day. Dr. Mike was reacting to some of the funniest medical memes. So I thought, hey, that's pretty cool. I might give that a try. Shout out to Dr. Mike for the great idea. So my wife thought she'd pick some medical memes that relate to the specialty in which I work. Because I haven't really seen them and I'm gonna react to them now and tell you whether they think they're accurate or are inaccurate, close to being the truth or whatever. Let's get to it. Uh, number one here. And then I said, the doctor will be with you in a minute. If you've seen my other video uh, about why you wait in the doctor's office, you'll know that this is so true. Although we try to schedule appointments and get patients seen in a timely fashion, there are little things that occur which throw our timing out the window. With me being a specialist, the wait times are often quite a bit longer than they are to see a general practitioner. Often they'll be waiting in the office one, two, and sometimes even three hours. What'd you say? Meme number two, tell me everything you told the nurses five minutes ago. This is so true. While we may get the basic gist of the story from the nurse, from the medical student, or from the resident, we always want to hear it directly from the horse's mouth. The sun's been up for an hour, shouldn't we get riding? In order to keep the, the flow of things going so that we can have multiple patients being assessed at the same time, we'll send in one of the junior staff to kind of get the nuts and bolts because this allows us to triage the situation so that we can go to see more important things first. But once we've triaged the patient using the junior staff or the nurse, and then we've gone to see the patient ourselves, although we know what the gist of the story is, we want to find all of the exact details. And so we're going to ask the patient again what their story is. I think it's really accurate and this is the reason why it happens. Okay, so this next one here, surgeon or a physician putting their glove on, you won't feel a thing except my fingers. Interestingly enough, we do have to put on gloves because we do have to do the rectal exam. That's something that's common in, in medicine, whether you're a family physician or a surgeon or other types of physicians. One of the things that I was happy about when I, when I went into orthopedics is the thought that, oh my God, I'm not gonna have to do rectal exams anymore. <laughs> However, I discovered during my residency that when you are on the spine service, which is part of the orthopedic surgery uh, department, patients come in and they have spinal injury uh, or suspected spinal injury, then we do have to do rectal exam. Let's see if I can get this. So that we can assess the rectal tone or the rectal motor function which allows us to know information about whether there is a spinal cord injury present and or the severity of the spinal cord injury if it is indeed there. Trust me, um, doing a rectal exam Let's see if I can get this. is not fun for anybody, but it's something that must be done in certain cases. So this one here, this guy stand there and he says, yeah, if my doctor could not use Google and WebMD in front of me, that'd be great. These days, there is so much information that is impossible to keep it all in your head and to be on top of everything. The pace of change, the information, as more and more studies are done, and as we find out more and more things about the body, and more and more things about our its interaction with medications and with the environment, it's impossible for us to have all that information in our heads uh, all the time. Furthermore, every physician walks around with one of these, a smartphone. With that, we can access information instantaneously. And sometimes you go, hmm, I'm not sure about this. I don't know about this, the dosage for this medication. Or this is something new that I haven't seen or it's an unusual presentation and you'll look it up. I still try not to do this in front of the patient. It does create a sense of doubt and even though I am a sports medicine physician with a subspecialty in arthroscopy, I still don't know everything about arthroscopy and I still don't know everything about orthopedics. One thing that I will say though, is that when we get information, we like to do so from peer reviewed sources. That means that we're just not going to any website where people are talking about this medical problem. We are going to websites where all the data that's been put on there has been peer reviewed. It's a research paper that has been put out to the academic population for 
for further scrutiny. And people have been able to comment on that to say whether they think it's the real deal and accurate or whether it's hocus pocus, mumbo jumbo, bull crap. I want to be politically correct here. At the end of the day, I'm all about trying to help patients get better. But I do think that this next one is really accurate. Sometimes we have to find very gentle ways of saying this to people. In this one, we have a doctor there. He's auscultating the patient's uh, chest to listen to uh, breathing sound. He's kind of looking off in the distance there. And he says, seems like you have a case of being a little I'm prescribing you a heavy dose of man but I get it. You know, if something happens to you and you are unsure about what is going on, the lack of knowledge can be associated with a high level of anxiety. You may get really nervous, really worked up, or really freaked out about something. But from a medical perspective, we may think that it is a relatively minor thing. So yeah, sometimes we gotta say that. We don't typically say it that way, but sometimes we're thinking it. Next one here says, doctors be like, Go buy this. This, unfortunately, is, is true. Guys are writing stuff down and it pretty much looks like a screw. Things are moving fast and you don't have time to make sure that you have great penmanship. Again, I'm, I'm gonna put on my political correct hat. There are good physicians and there are bad physicians. There are some physicians that I would like to touch me and there are others that I would not. Okay. So this one here, it says, if I collapse at work, here's a list of doctors that I don't want working on me. The true gold standard for me is whether another physician would voluntarily come to me for treatment. They know whether your care has been good or not, whether your results have been good or not, whether you've had a lot of complications or not. So they know all that information. If a physician comes to me, then that to me is the seal of approval. Having said that, there are physicians where if I need something done, I have a list in my head of people that I would go to without any hesitation, no problems. But then there is also another list in my head where it is what it is. I'm sure everybody tries their best. We are not all created equal. Okay, so this next one, this is super true. My wife can attest to this. Anybody who's been in the hospital before will know this. It's got a cat looking up and to the side. Um, and it says, when you're on call, and the phone rings. All physicians, we have to do call. That's one of the requirements, particularly if you have a hospital-based practice. You could just sit in the hospital and wait for something to happen. Or you could go about your life and hope the phone doesn't ring. I've kind of done both. And when I was young, first started working, I would be in the hospital all the time. As I started to get older and realized I didn't have much of a life because I was in the hospital seven days a week all the time, all the time, I, I stopped doing that. And so now, when you're on call and the phone rings, uh, you don't know. Is it something simple where they just wanna ask you a question? Or is it something more complex where you gotta stop what you're doing, whatever it is, and go into the hospital? I know that look very well, as does any other physician who has covered call. So this one says, patient up top, my pain is 10 out of 10. Down at the bottom, you have the physician or, or the, the, the nurse, whatever. They say, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. If you want to know what I think about pain and how I think that impacts patients, then you can check out my blog post. I'll leave a link in the description down below. And again, this goes back to people not having an understanding of uh, medical situations. Also, maybe not having a high degree of body awareness. Generally, we have a pain scale in medicine. It is usually at zero to 10 where zero is no pain and 10 is the worst you ever felt. This is what I say to my patient. On a scale of zero to 10, zero is no pain. 10 is where you would pay me money out of your pocket right now to cut that thing off. In other words, you would not be able to tell me that your pain is 10 out of 10 because you would be so wrapped by that pain that you would be a quivering mess on the floor. So when you say to us, my pain is a 10 out of 10, it doesn't mean what you think it means. Keep that in mind next time a doctor asks you to rate your pain. That's the last one. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can become part of the intern army. If you are a returning subscriber, you know what to do. Go hit the like button. And as always, this has been a word from Dr. Chris 
Not your everyday portal. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>